Church, let's stand together and open our Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. It's only taken us about a year and a half to get here, but we're on the move now. Just basically a little bit halfway through the book, and uh, now from here on out, things change in a very, very powerful way. Romans chapter 7. I'll read the odd-numbered verses. If you'll read together on the screen, the even-numbered verses uh, will go to verse 6 today. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law. That's the Jewish believers. Those are the Jews who came to know Jesus as Messiah, who lived there in Italy, specifically Rome. That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So then if while her husband lives, she's marry, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me first of all say the title of the message and then. The follow-up, very important. The title of the message is Getting Free from a Fatal Relationship. (laughs) Getting free from a fatal relationship. Somebody might say, oh boy, I wanted marriage counseling this morning. (laughs) But that's not what we're talking about. You say, well, wait a minute. I talked about marriage and remarriage. I talked about adultery and adulteress. Yeah, listen. Many people have made the mistake of using Romans chapter 7 to look at that as an argument regarding marriage counseling. It has nothing to do with marriage counseling. Romans chapter 7, Paul is teaching us something regarding the transaction of ownership between the law and the unbeliever versus the ownership of Christ to the believer. This is not a marriage, remarriage issue. He is saying simply this, that if a woman is bound to a man, and by the way, a man to a woman in marriage, the only thing that can break that is a legal separation being death. You saw many times the word death was mentioned. And so we'll bring this up as we go through this study, but don't be distracted. Some scholars have written that this is a chapter that should not have been written. I tell you, some people with the, this is the Bible, God's word. There are scholars who say Romans chapter seven shouldn't have been written. And when they tell you the reason why, it's because it's too, uh, one, one scholar said it's too brash. And he went on to explain this. It talks about uh, the, the person who's caught up in temptation, knows what to do, but doesn't do it. Uh, is, is experiencing difficulty in the walk with God and Romans 7 should be avoided. And then there's scholars on the other side saying Romans 7 is a profound insight into the struggle of the believer. And it's interesting how the pendulum can swing so far apart, so much so that I have to tell you some churches do not teach the book of Romans chapter 7. In fact, listen to this. Look what J. Vernon McGee has to say about this. It's quite comical. Leave it up to J. Vernon McGee. But Dr. J. Vernon McGee says, I was taught in Bible school that from Romans chapter 6, should I read read it in his accent? (laughs) I was taught in Bible school that from Romans chapter 6, you ought to just take a detour Drive around Romans 7 so you can hurry on over to chapter 8. You can just hear him say it. I wish we could hear him say it right now. 
But I love that. And then he went on to say, by the way, boy, was I taught wrong in Bible college. No, you don't go from Romans 6 and drive around until you get to Romans 8. You go right through Romans 7. God's word is not something that we pick and choose what we study and what we don't study. This is the eternal word of God. And it's there for a purpose. And it is beautiful and clear for the purpose. So in this, we're going to be looking at for a good portion of these chapters leading chapter uh, 7 and chapter 8, talking about sanctification. There'll be elements of justification and sanctification. So if you're new to Christianity or you're thinking about being a follower of Jesus, the Bible tells us that justification is that when we come to faith in Jesus, that we are justified from our sins because that's what Jesus did at the cross. If you ask the question, why did Jesus die on the cross? The answer is, is he died there to justify all sinners who would put their trust in him. The Bible says that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. Once you make that decision to follow Christ, you are justified by God. God makes that determination. Isn't that amazing? You say, well, I'm this person, I'm that person. Well, you come to Christ and God washes your slate clean, washes it. And by the way, all your life, my life, we always have to keep going back to remind ourselves, he's washed the slate clean. Whatever we were before, we're no longer that. He washes the slate clean, and he puts us in Jesus. That's justification. And then he turns around, and he starts this work of sanctification, which means his Holy Spirit goes to work in us to make us like Jesus. Every year, you and I should be a little bit more like Jesus. That's God's plan. Isn't that a beautiful plan? Imagine if Christians really took this seriously and began to really mimic Jesus what the world would be like. (laughs) Amazing. The Bible tells us regarding the sanctification work of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, it says this, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. You ought to underline that in your note taken or your Bible. Who does the sanctifying church? Who does it? God does it. You don't do it. See, religion will tell you, the law will tell you, you do it. But you can't do it. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body. That right there speaks of the trichotomy. Listen up. The trichotomy of who we are. You, who you are, you've been created a body. That's obvious. Soul, your thinking. Suke, that's where we get the Greek word psychology. Suke, your mind, which is amazing. We talked about that on Wednesday night. If we took, if we opened up the top of your head and took out your brain, all we would have is this meaty, slimy, uh, eight pound thing that few people even know a little bit about it. It's a mystery. It's more fantastic than the entire uh, observable universe that this thing is an apparatus by which what somehow flows in and around it is this this consciousness. Your mind. And then your spirit. What is that spirit? Lowercase s, spirit. This is the part of you that lives eternally. In heaven or in hell, the spirit of you. The person that is literally you is the spirit person of who you are. And the Bible says that you and I are either alive or we're dead spiritually. You say, well, well, I'm alive right now. You can physically be alive, but be spiritually dead at the exact same time. And the way that works is all played out in what Watchman Nee wrote in his book called The Spiritual Man is that the mind is the mistress of any man. And when he says man, he means men and women, men and women. And your, so uh, your mind will think about things, and whatever your mind thinks about is based on who's in charge. I want you to know that right now. I'm going to give you some honesty. It's going to hit you really hard right upside the face any second now. Are you hanging on? If your flesh is in charge, you think flesh thoughts. Your mind thinks things like, when are you going to be good? When are you going to end this? Not for 44 minutes from here. For, I got 44 minutes and 45 seconds left. Your mind is thinking thoughts like this. 
Boy, I can't wait to meet up with her again. Whew, I wonder what time that's going to happen. Your mind is thinking thoughts like this. Boy, the person next to me sure stinks. Or boy, I'm sure I'm better than they are. Your mind, your lost mind. Listen, because your flesh is in charge, your mind thinks like that. Because you're spiritually dead. But when you become spiritually alive, your mind starts thinking spiritual thoughts. Your mind starts thinking thoughts like this. I wonder what Jesus would do in the situation I'm in right now. I wonder, I wonder what's going on in the church today. I need to go find out. What, I wonder what I can do. I, what, I'm going to go do that verse. I just did that Bible study. I'm going to go. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. And that's why he calls the mind the mistress of a man. You know, the mind will follow whoever's in charge. And the one you feed the most is the one that's going to lead. You, you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap of the flesh. You sow to the spirit, the Bible says you're going to reap everlasting life. And your mind will follow whoever's in charge. Your mind will go either way, whoever's the boss. And what we want to do as believers is make sure that the spirit is being in hot pursuit of God. And so the Bible's very clear about that. May, may he sanctify you body, soul, and spirit and preserve you blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's awesome. I love it because it's the work of God. Verse 24 says, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. I love that. I love that. God does it. Lord, I present myself. I mean, here I am, warts and all, but I'm willing to follow you. And Lord, I yield to you. God takes over in your life. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, love has been perfected or completed among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Can you imagine being bold in the day of judgment? Listen, I'm, I have to tell you, I am working to that end in my own life. Not working for my salvation. I already have salvation. Jesus gave it to me. But now that I'm a Christian, I want to do everything I can so that I can stand before the Lord on the day of judgment and, be, and just go like this. Okay, God, do it. And he's going to judge my motives. He's going to judge my actions. It has nothing to do with salvation. Every believer is going to be judged, but it has nothing to do with losing your salvation or getting punted out of heaven into hell. No, he's going to look. And then as he looks at us, the Bible says he's going to reward us based upon those things we did to glorify him. And listen, I want him to have that to be an amazing day. I, like Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan preacher, and the president of just about everything, Yale or Corn Princeton, Har- I don't know, whatever, Harvard. What, he was, in fact, to this day, like, I, like this, it does tell me the day on here. <laughs> to this day, Jonathan Edwards is considered the greatest thinker America has ever produced. Did you know that? Jonathan Edwards, you had to read his writings. The great Puritan preacher, he said, I am intending to live now my life to obtain the greatest happiness in the world to come. And people read that and said, are you, wow, that's crazy. But it's not crazy. He wants to live for Jesus in such a way that when he stands before the Lord and forevermore, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Absolutely awesome. If the world would see a version of Christianity on fire biblically, I think the world would sit up and say, I want to be one of those. Not to join a church, not to be part of a group, but to be a Christ follower. And that's what the world needs to see right now. That's why you've come to this church. And I know that's true because we have no membership. Did you know that? Are you visiting? Well, I've decided to be a member. Just keep showing up then. Well, where do I, where do I sign? Nowhere. Well, do I have to go to a club meeting? Do I have to go? No. Just decide to follow Jesus. And uh, let's bring as many men and women and boys and girls with us into the kingdom of heaven. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, my little children for whom I labor again until Christ is formed in you. That's the life of the believer. We are to be walking, breathing images of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our goal. You think about people right now. So uh, this is Sunday. There's a lot of football games going on in America right now. Um, you see police officers, military, they wear their... Now, as I mentioned the other day, military and, and uh, police officers, they wear uniforms. 
but uh, a lot of football going on. They're, they are not wearing uniforms. You know that? I know they try to say that. Well, um, oh, look at their uniforms. Okay. Right now, a dear friend of ours, we're all praying for Sam Howell. He's first year, right, with the Washington Commanders. I'm praying any second he gets put in the game. It's his first year, but the quarterback ahead of him is doing really bad right now. And, uh, and Sam loves the Lord, and we talk every week, and so my prayer is, oh, Lord, put Sam in. <laughs> and I have to tell you the reason why is because Sam will always give glory to Jesus. Amen. I love that. Whatever platform it is for you. But let's, let, let's make this clear. The rams that are running around, those are costumes. <laughs> Military wear uniforms. But if you're a charger, it's a costume. If you, listen, it's true. <laughs> But are you giving glory to God in that thing? And whatever God has called you, God wants to literally use you in whatever arena of life that you live that you might exhibit the love of God. And the beautiful thing about that is God is versatile. I know many of you who are in law enforcement. This is a very heavily populated law enforcement church. You've got a tough call, but God is there with you. He leads you. I had a guy tell me, uh, he's a sergeant. I won't say what city, what department, what county. But he said, um, this is what I do, and I'm arresting a guy, or I'm going to put a guy in the car, and this is what I'm saying, and this is what I'm saying. And then once he's in the car, and uh, once we get going, I, he said, that guy's all mine. Yeah. And he said he gets the gospel all the way to the station. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love it. I love it. Jude chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. This is another great statement, Christian, that you ought to write this down and remember that God does Christianity to you. Your job and mine is to yield to him, to, to surrender to him. Jude 1, 24. Now to him who is able to keep you. Why does it say that? Because you can't keep yourself from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Isn't that awesome? God is not only going to keep you, but he's going to bring you into his presence. And now hear me out. You are going to be so excited about it. Can you imagine? You are going to flip when, you are, when you're entering eternity. It's going to be over the top. Okay? But before I keep reading, let me... Oh, I'm going from memory now, so listen. This could be dangerous. It's the book of Zephaniah, could be chapter 3, verse 17, I'm not sure. But it's the book of Zephaniah, where the scriptures tell us that the Lord, when we come before him, that the Lord, he will sing. He will sing before us, and the scripture says he will rejoice over us in his love. And the word in Hebrew for rejoice is to twirl. Does that sound a little disrespectful? Can you even begin to... Embrace the moment that God says, Jack, come here. <laughs> Jack, woo, come here. And the Bible says that he's going to sing and he's going to spin. You know, especially if you're Jewish, you can already kind of get this. <laughs> you could see God do this. Zephaniah, when you enter heaven, he's not only able to save you, he's able to preserve you and I all the way through to the end and to stand before him rejoicing with exceeding joy. Verse 25, to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever and all God's people said, Amen. what an awesome God we have. Do you know him? Do you have this assurance? The Bible says, John's gospel says, all these things have been written, excuse me, 1 John, these things have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. Don't be guessing. You're to know it. And that's part of the job of the Holy Spirit. God is changing us. Right before service, there was a couple out there, and they walked up to me, and the man stuck out his hand to shake my hand. And as soon as I touched his hand, he said, I just wanted to say, and he goes like this. He goes, I just wanted to say. And she stepped, the wife stepped back and she's, she folded her arms and she's looking at him and she's looking at me, looking at him, looking at me. And he said, I just want to say that we've been coming here since COVID, since May 31st. And he said, my life has been completely transformed. And she goes, she goes like this. She goes, it's true. 
Anytime a woman, a wife says, and it's true, that's the work of God. That's the work of God. It doesn't always go that, that smooth and that easy, but I don't know if some of you old timers remember Ray Steadman. He was a tremendous Bible teacher at the Peninsula Bible Church up in Palo Alto, California, and that part of the world could need another Ray Steadman, I'll tell you that. But um, he, he, he's, he's quoted the, this unknown author, and maybe it's from a song, I don't know, an old hymn, but it certainly is uh, life, isn't it? He says, to dwell above with saints in love, that will be glory. But to stay below with the saints I know, well, that's another story. <laughs> Is that good? What does that mean? That means all of us are at a different place of spiritual growth and development all along the way. Some of you are old seasoned saints. Some of you are old but still not much matured saints. There are some young saints that are light years ahead of us. There's some young saints that got a long way to go yet. There's some things that God did in our lives in the instant we accepted him. There's some things in life where God is still working on us. Remember that. We're all under construction. And the Holy Spirit is molding and shaping Christ in us. And Paul is communicating this to the church at Rome. And so we look at it in our first point is in verses 1 to 2. And we won't even get very far in that. But getting free from a fatal relationship is this, mark it down, DOA is when faith comes alive. When I say DOA, uh, what does that mean? Dead on arrival. <laughs> Dead on arrival is when faith comes alive. You say, what do you mean by that? When Paul is talking about life, death, law, married, remarried, what is he speaking about? He's speaking about those who, in a moment, we'll see, Look at verse 1, that he's talking to his brethren, the Jew, who has come to faith in Christ. Look at verse 1. Or do you not know? Picking it up from chapter 6. Do you not know, brethren, and then a parenthetical insert says, for I speak to those who know the law. I'm talking to my Jewish brothers who are now born again. Which, by the way, listen, church. If you're Jewish, being born again ought to be more natural, supernatural to you than a Gentile. To whom did the gospel arrive to first, church? The Jews. It was God's plan, certainly revealed in the book of Isaiah, that his people would preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. But the religious leadership of Israel rejected Christ, and Jesus made that very clear on the Palm Sunday road. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. For you have failed to recognize the day of your visitation, and behold, your house, no, no uh, doubt he motioned toward the temple, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. 70 AD, when the Romans, under the leadership of then General uh, Titus Vespasian came in and put down an uprising and the great temple was torn down as the gold began to melt and flow between each rock, each stone. By the way, when I say stones, many of us have been there. Those stones are the size of 55 foot shipping containers, one stone. And Rome ordered the gold to be taken out from all the cracks, fulfilling the very prophecy of Jesus Christ himself. But the announcement to the Jew first, remember, we forget who Nicodemus was. Because, you know, listen, people, there's some bad teaching out there among so-called evangelicals that say, uh, the Jews get saved by keeping the law. We are the ones that have to be born again. Did you know that's heresy? Yes. They forget that the first person who ever heard about being born again was a Jew. His name was Nicodemus. John chapter 3. To be born again is to be born from above or born of the Spirit. And for the last 2,000 years, that gospel has gone out to the ends of the earth by people just like you and I sharing with one another the gospel. And oh, by the way, they'll have, the Jews will have another chance, by the way. If you read the book of Revelation, that's what that's all about. They're going to have another chance again, and they're going to do it very well, according to Bible prophecy, 
to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. But church, we're looking at this right now, and that is a living faith brings an end to dead belief. Can you please write that down? I want you to think about that. I want you to be meditating on this. A living faith brings an end, death, to a dead belief. Belief, listen, belief is where you begin. When people say, all you have to do is believe, wait a minute, wait, we have to dissect that very carefully. When we talk about belief, the Bible says in the book of James, Satan and his demons believe in Jesus and they tremble, but they're not saved. They're not forgiven. Belief. What do you believe? We say, I believe this, I believe that. But do you actually live like that? Do you actually conduct and think like that? Whatever your belief is. In other words, do you just say that you believe that because you've chosen not to believe in anything else but that, and either A, you live it out in your life, it is called your lifestyle or your worldview, or you say that you believe it but it doesn't even do anything to your life. Are you hearing me? This is important stuff. As believers, we would think, we would look at it this way. The disciples, when Jesus invited the disciples to follow him, Remember this. He went to Matthew, for example, at the toll gate. Remember Matthew's collecting taxes? And Jesus walks right by. I'm sorry, I see it this way. Matthew's not letting anybody through unless they pay their fee. And I, I'm, I could just see Jesus. It's like driving on the toll road without a pass. <laughs> I, just, I just see Jesus go like this. Walks right past the gate. <laughs> and you could just see Matthew. Excuse me, excuse me. You have to pay your tax. And I could just see Jesus go, come, follow me. And he, keeps, and he just walks. And Matthew's like, oh my gosh. And, he, and the Bible says he gets up and he follows Jesus. Had to be awesome to watch. And as he began to assemble his disciples, many times the Bible says that Jesus said this, or Jesus said that, and they didn't understand, it says, because they didn't have faith in him. They believed enough to walk with him, but the whole test for three years was would they stay with him? Are you hearing me? This is why you and I see in life so many times these illegitimate or premature, so to speak, births in what is called the kingdom of God. Oh, I believe. Oh, stand up if you believe. Hallelujah. Come, if you're wearing a green shirt, come forward and be safe. All of this stuff. And it's like, what's going on here? It's a circus. And then listen, or you know, you need to come. Listen, we need to go forward. Maybe it's a crusade or maybe it's even here at church. Hey, we, need, we, we should go forward. So you go forward. I don't want to go forward. I have more respect for the person who says, I don't want to go forward. You go forward. But when somebody says, hey, I'm going to go forward. You want to go forward? Well, then, yeah, sure. Sure. That's not responding to the gospel. When you respond to the gospel, it's you understanding, wait a minute. I'm enslaved to sin. I'm bound to it, and I don't want to be bound to it anymore, and so I'm going to respond to the gospel, and I'm going to go from, of course I believe in Jesus. This is America. Everybody believes in Jesus, but who has faith in Jesus? Your belief should be like a little car that drives you to faith. Ask somebody. Ask your friends. Do you believe in Jesus? Look, you cannot deny nobody, I don't think, Anybody would deny the existence of Jesus. He's a historical proven fact. I don't believe in Jesus. What do you mean by that? If they say, I don't believe in his teachings, okay, but you don't deny he existed. No, no, I'm not dumb. But so you, you deny his teachings. That's, that's one way of b- belief, or the other belief would be, I think his teachings are amazing. I just don't practice them. You want to know why that's true? Many of us know people just like this because they don't have faith in them. They'll tell you, I believe. But they don't have faith. Big difference. Faith is when you just lay your life down in his hands. Faith is when you just sit down. You walked in here today and you sat down. Did any of you stop and say, I don't know, man. I don't know if this chair's going to hold me or not. <laughs> Did you think that? You 
just sat down. You had so much faith in that chair, you didn't even think about it. It always amazes me that we all drive down to the airport, get in an airplane, strap ourselves in. Do you have any idea what's going on? <laughs> and what emotional condition is the pilot up in the front? How was his day? <laughs> and well, put on seatbelt. Here we go. Where are you going? <laughs> and they power those engines up and you hear the plane rumbling and you're flying down the runway. Where are you going? I don't know, but we are going. <laughs> it's faith that you got that ticket, you went to the airport, you sat in that seat, and you're planning on landing in Hawaii. You have faith that that, that system's going to get you to Hawaii. Listen, same is true for the Christian. My belief has brought me to the place of faith. I trust him. I'm no longer trusting in this world. I've done that. And it almost killed me. I am now going to follow Christ. I'm free from the world. Listen, that relationship, there, that was a fatal relationship. And it's dead now as a believer. I'm dead to the world. And I'm married to another. And that's Christ Jesus. You can have a belief that actually winds up condemning you to hell. Because it will never bring you to faith. Your belief is all spiritual. You're a spiritual person. You got crystals in the pyramids and you got a cross and you got a crescent moon and you got a, a, a Hindu statue and you got a, a Buddha and you've got, you got all the stuff. And you're very spiritual. Did you feel that? Are you feeling that? Are you feeling that? I just really sent something. Listen, you can be very spiritual and have belief, but listen, you have no faith because if you had faith, you would realize, I've tested every single one of these things and they can't hold me up. And God says, you come to me and I'll hold you up. You come, you come, you sit down, you watch and see and I'll hold you up. The audacity of God, think about it. You come to me. If your life is laden and weary and you're tired, I'll give you rest. What a statement. If you're a skeptic in the house today, you ought to stop and... After service, ask somebody, hey, did Jesus change your life? You should ask people. The number one selling point, and I use that in a carnal sense, the number one selling point regarding Jesus Christ are those who follow him. We've got nothing to peddle, but we've got something to say. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I used to be this, and now I'm that. Remarkable. A living faith brings an end to dead belief because God is not inviting you to experience religion. He wants a relationship with you. In the book of James, chapter 2, hang on now, book of James. James is, whenever you go to James, you better put on your seatbelt. James, chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Did you know that? That's what the law teaches. You know the Ten Commandments? They're written in stone, you know. You'll never hear the Ten Commandments say anything to you. The Ten Commandments are like this. You say, I'm not feeling very good today. My life's falling apart. I need mercy. I need grace. Ten Commandments has no feelings. Ten Commandments just says, uh, God's holy and you're not. God is righteous and you're not. The commandments are awesome. They're perfect. I was on the 14th floor of a Russian flat in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I had a translator with me and I was talking to a man at his table in his flat. And he was trying to convince me that he didn't need Jesus. And he was very proud of himself. Very moral man. And yet, uh, I hope things are different in Russia now, but to drink the water, you had to boil the water. Water out of the tap would actually make you sick. The, the smell of it and at the top of it, you could see the purple swirling of oil and stuff. And you scrape that off and you boil the water. Well, we had bottled water. I was sharing and we had our cups, our glasses there, crystal clear. 
And I see, you know, the Bible tells us that if we break one law of the Ten Commandments, we're guilty of them all. And he said, I'm good. And I said, you know, the Bible says this, that if you've, if you've committed adultery, you're, you've broke the Ten Commandments. He goes, I've never committed adultery. I go, well, let me be more specific. Jesus said, if you've looked at a woman with lust in your eyes for her, you've committed adultery. And he goes, well, who hasn't done that? And I said, that's exactly my point. I said, if, we're, if you're going up the wall and you're pulling yourself up on, on, on a chain, how many of those links that are ahead of you have to break before you fall? Only one. And if you break one, James says, you're guilty of them all. You got to understand, if you break one, the rest of them doesn't matter because you're falling. And so I told him, I said, listen, if I had right now in this dropper, if I had right now, if I could drop three drops of cyanide liquid into your cup right now, would you drink it? He goes, no way. Actually, he said, yet. <laughs> and I said, how about just two drops? Two drops, 16 ounces of water, two drops of cyanide. Come on, it's clear. Can't smell it, can't taste it. It's he goes, nope. I said, how about if I put one drop of poison in your cup of water, would you drink it? And he goes, never. I go, why? He goes, because it would kill me. And I said, listen, those are your words. Jesus said, you had the thought and you're guilty. Does God say this to us because he hates us? No, he says this to us because he loves us. Because God sees you on the inside. God hears you. God knows you from the inside out. And so James 2.11 says, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Isn't that an interesting statement? So I've never murdered anybody. Have you ever hated anybody? So I don't know if I, I mean, hate, that's a pretty big word. Well, have you ever destroyed someone's reputation? Then you've murdered them. They're fine. No, God says you murdered them. We're guilty. The chain broke. Now listen, I'm going somewhere with this. You want to get free from a fatal relationship, friends, because the law looks at you and says, nope, you thought it, you're out. Remember, the law is stone. It has no heart. It has, it has no ears. So Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ. Notice the diagnosis or the prognosis of this. Justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. I can tell you this. The only way to qualify to get to heaven is that you have to be a sinner. I'll explain this more in a moment. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, it begins at verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made... I should stop myself right now. Is everybody awake? Yes. Take a deep breath. Okay. Exhale, but don't breathe on anybody. You need it. This is dead serious. Watch this. Pay close attention. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Stop right there. This is a test. Watch out. Slow down. If you're reading that and you are involved in a fatal relationship with God, meaning it's based on legalism, you look at that and you say, yeah, that's right on. Oh, I believe that. I'm pretty good. Better than the person next to me. I'm all right. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person? I'm above all that. I've, I, I'm good. I know Jesus died for the sins of people, but after all, it's me we're talking about here. 
It's like you're a, like you're a legend in your own mind. No, see, look, but for the lawless, this is who Jesus died for, watch. For the lawless, insubordinate, for the ungodly, listen, and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murders of fathers, murders of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites. This word needs to be announced today all around the world. Jesus died on the cross to set sodomites free from their imprisonment. But listen, kidnappers, human traffickers, for liars, he died for perjurers. Oh, and then he throws this in. And if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Do you read this right? Are you seeing this clearly? The last person you want to be on this screen is the person where it says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. A righteous person is who Jesus addressed when he came and he said, don't think I've come for the healthy. I've come for those that are sick. Do you remember him saying that? You don't want to be self-righteous in your own opinion, in your own legalism. You don't want to be caught declaring yourself not in need of Jesus' sacrifice at the cross. This is, he's laying it out. The whole argument is this, that every sodomite, fornicator, manslayer, human trafficker, the ungodly, the sinners, the lawless, the insubordinate, all of us would say, save me, Jesus, save me. And all of a sudden, your pride is either smacked right now or your heart is starting to warm up to the love of God. You may have never committed these things physically, but down inside, you thought them. And Jesus says, I want to forgive you. You come to me and I want to wash you clean. The person he cannot wash clean is the person that sees no need of the Savior. Are you hearing this? They don't see their need for Christ, but the authority of the law is where they make their place. And I must say that the authority of the law, though it's holy and perfect and just, is not a good motivator. I don't know if any of you are employers or if you're parents, you want your kids to respond to you out of love. Wouldn't that be great if we had, hey, Junior, clean up your room. Yes, Dad, I love you so much. I will be delighted to clean my room. Wouldn't that be amazing? Legalism has to say with authority. If you don't clean your room, you're going to be locked in it <laughs> for weeks. You know what I'm saying? Love is the motivator. Authority and legalism is not. God wants us to respond to his overture of love. And it's important. Listen to this. This is... This is amazing. I, in my mind, I can see this in technicolor. I, I wonder how it really played out, though, in real, real time. John 21. In John chapter 21, uh, all the disciples are gathered together. They're with Jesus. So when they had eaten breakfast, they're all together. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Some people say that Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me more than fish? which I think is kind of lame, personally. Or do you love me more than these other guys? Because Peter, Peter kind of had that problem. Remember, Peter earlier had said, if everybody in this circle forsakes you, I won't. Remember that? Lord, I'm willing to go to Jerusalem and die with you. Peter was saying, I'm, I'm the, you can depend on me. That's why, that's why Peter had a rough road. Remember, it was Peter who denied Jesus to his face. And then he started cussing about it. The Bible says he started cussing. And then he says, I don't even know the guy. And then the rooster, ah, 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 <laughs> what, three times. <laughs> and the Bible says all Jesus did was look, when the rooster crowed three times, Jesus looked at Peter. 
He just looked. Oh, we can't even imagine what was in, in that exchange, in that moment. Now, listen. Simon, do you love me more than these? The rest of these guys? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. The word actually is, in Greek, is love my lambs. Love them. Love my lambs, Peter, by feeding them. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep, or the word is care for my sheep. If you love my sheep, you're going to care for my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter now grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And so Jesus said, love my sheep, feed my sheep. Love them, care for them, love them. But Peter's grieved. Peter, do you love me? Yep. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? And Jesus, listen, are you listening? Jesus got Peter to say what was the truth. Because if it wouldn't have come the third time, he would have asked him the fourth time. And Peter said, the language is this, yes, Lord, you know that I'm very fond of you. Have you ever said you love God? This happens to me all the time. Every time I tell God, you know what? This is between you and I. This morning, about 3.15, in my backyard, hands raised straight up, starry sky. And I told the Lord some things. I was praying, and I told him, I love you. And as soon as I said that, it's like, can I bring that word, can I bring those words back? Because I kind of so don't love you. I do, but I don't. I feel like I don't because when I say that I love you, it's so pathetic. My love for you is so weak. You deserve so much more from me. God, I don't even have the capacity to give you the love that you're worthy of and I'm just such a wretch of a vessel that even the words come bouncing back from the heavens onto my own face. You're so amazing. So here's my prayer, oh God, Help me to love you more. Can you imagine? Love. The beautiful thing about this is Peter must have learned his lesson because way later on in life, Peter wrote in his epistle, 1 Peter 4, 8, above all things have fervent love one for another. Why? For love will cover a multitude of sins. (laughs) <laughs> he got it. He got it. Paul says it this way. In Philippians 3, we'll have to end here. Philippians 3, verse 3, Paul says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Are you guys awake? We're almost done. You awake? Yeah. Philippians 3.3 3 is incredibly graphic. And I'm, uh, I'm just going to tell you straight up. Paul is saying, we who are Jews or Gentiles is irrelevant. Our hearts have been circumcised. We have no confidence in our flesh. You know what that means? We have no confidence in human actions. More specifically, we have no confidence in being baptized in water or being circumcised. We have no confidence because the Jews... They had it so down to a science. Were you circumcised? Yes, I was circumcised. Were you circumcised? I was circumcised. Well, how much were you circumcised? I was circumcised. But how much were you circumcised? The more circumcision, the holier you are. That's why Paul said in another place, those who preach circumcision, he said, why don't they just come forward and we'll cut the whole thing off? He called, I'm not joking, he called them the mutilation. He said they should all be cut off. 
If that's how they're going to judge themselves, you want to be holy, do you? Well, then let's just do the whole thing. (laughs) And after all that suffering, you're no holier. Wow. Well, you know what? We laugh at that, but God, I gave 20 bucks this week. Come on, bless me. I got a flat tire in the parking lot. I just gave you 50 bucks. Listen, you don't know what you're even doing. Verse 4, Philippians 3, Though I I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. It's so cute. Paul said, you want to talk about flesh? All right, let's go for it. You can just see this awesome spiritual man in his old age and all these guys talking about how righteous they are. And Paul says, all right, just put a sock in it. Move over. You want to talk about, you want to talk about being bound to the law? You want to talk about doing it your way? Rolling up your sleeves and being holy, are you? All right. And, and in my mind, I see these, these Jews at like a saloon with the... I'm going to show you a thing or two. And listen to him. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day. You can just see Paul. Were you Jews circumcised the eighth day? I was. Of the stock of Israel. Can you say that? Of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Wow, that means Paul was previously married, by the way. To be a Pharisee, you had to be married. A Pharisee. That means his life was dedicated to the study of the word. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Paul was like the ISIS of the day. He went around hunting Christians down and having them killed. Concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Wow. Yet indeed, I also count all things less uh, loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The word is actually manure for rubbish. That I may gain Christ and be found in him. Here it comes. Not having my own righteousness, from, uh, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Dead on arrival is a belief system that has no faith in God. And it's possible that you're in this crowd right here, right now, and that you have been going to church maybe all your life, or maybe you stumbled in here today and you say, Well, I believe in God, but you have no experience of the Holy Spirit with incredible bonds of love. I don't know how to explain it. God, listen, like Paul was speaking, are, who are you married to? Are you married to the law? Are you married to Christ? If one dies, then you're free to marry the other. If the law is dead, it's because it's been fulfilled in Jesus. The option is, what will you choose? Will you choose to hook yourself up to a law or the law? Or will you choose to hook yourself up to Christ Jesus, who is liberty? So who are you married to? Well, I believe. Not enough. Your belief must take you to faith. And that faith is where you throw yourself down at all that he's done for you. We're going to pray right now. You know what? Some of you need to make this decision. You have played long enough religion. You're done. You're all done with it. You've come into this place today. I'm going to be a little bit bold. You've come in here today. You thought, you, I'm going to check it out or whatever. And listen, God had you here. God brought you here. And he brought you here for this reason right now. Let's pray. Father, we bow our heads. We bow our hearts before you. And Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would come and you would move in the midst of every heart. To know, Lord, just like you did in the days of Egypt in the Exodus, you had your angel pass by and that angel could see if that home was protected by the blood of the lamb or not. And you know, everybody in the sanctuary who are protected by the blood of the lamb or not. 
And Father, I pray that you would arrest those today whom you love. And up until now, they think they have evaded you. Up until now, they think that they have somehow eluded you. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you'd move upon their hearts right now and capture them. May the love of God capture them now. That God loved you, my friends, so much that Jesus died on the cross for your sins because you cannot ever pay God back. You may owe that credit card company a dollar or two, or you may owe that mortgage company a dollar or two. But friends, you can never pay God back for what he did for you at the cross, except one thing he requires of you, and that is to come and to receive and to acknowledge what he's done for you. That's what he wants from you, you personally today, you. Now listen, in a moment, some of you listen carefully. In a moment, some of you are going to sense this odd, strange stirring in your heart, in your chest. Some of you are going to start to feel like you're the only one in the room. I want you to know now in advance, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And I want to warn you right now, he's going to talk to you in your voice, but he's going to use words you've never heard before. You listen for him. And if he's speaking to you, you respond to him. When you're done praying this prayer, I want to tell you right now, at some point today, someone's going to try, even if it's a thought in your head, someone, some thought's going to enter your mind and say, that wasn't for real. Jesus said when someone accepts him, the enemy will come and try to steal the truth that was put in your heart. Someone's going to say something, or maybe you'll have a thought in your head, and like, what did you do? What was that all about? I'm telling you in advance to pull the mask off the enemy. Are you hearing me? You made this decision today based on your will being changed. You didn't, nobody put a feather up and down your neck and gave you goosebumps to promote you to come forward. You decided to come forward. And you remember that you decided to follow Christ. It wasn't based on your feelings. You were responding to his call to you. This is between you and God. Are you ready? You ready to pray out loud? Dear Lord Jesus... I give you my life today. I ask you to wash me of my sins based on the cross of Christ because I confess Jesus Christ crucified and Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Today, he is my Lord and Savior and I want heaven and hell to know in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. amen.